Our first reading this morning is from the book of John, chapter 1. In the beginning, there was the Word. The Word was in God's presence, and the Word was God. The Word was present to God from the beginning. Through the Word, all things came into being, and apart from the Word, nothing came into being that has come into being. In the Word was life, and that life was humanity's light, a light that shines in the darkness, a light that the darkness has never overtaken. And now from Proverbs chapter 8. The Holy One gave birth to me at the beginning before the first acts of creation. I have been from everlasting in the beginning before the world began. Before the deep seas I was brought forth, before there were fountains or springs of water, before the mountains erupted up into place, before the hills I was born, before God created the earth or its fields, or even the first clods of dirt. I was there when the Almighty created the heavens and set the horizon just above the ocean, set the sky, clouds in the sky and established the springs of the deep, gave the seas their boundaries and set their limits at the shoreline. When the foundation of the earth was laid out, I was the skilled artisan standing next to the Almighty. I was God's delight day after day, rejoicing at being in God's presence continually, rejoicing in the whole world and delighting in humankind. And so, my daughters and sons, hear me well. Happy are you when you keep my ways. Take my instructions seriously and grow wise. Don't neglect my lessons. Happy are you who listen to me and keep watch at my door for me, waiting at my gates, for you who find me find life and earn the favor of the Holy One. But you who lose me, lose your own souls, for all who hate me love death. Ancient words for our present day consideration. I always mention that Easter is a tough day to preach. We have visitors, and our, at least my message is very non-traditional. So that's kind of a challenge to, to not like rock people's boats. <clears throat> Earth Day is also a challenge for me. Um, I know that when people come to church, you may have had a long, hard week, and you're just trying to get, get through. You, you want to put one foot in front of the other, and the last thing you need is to come to a church and hear that your species is on a death spiral, and uh, <laughs> which some of you see as a downer. I, I don't tell. Uh, <laughs> but, but what do we do about that? Because it's kind of a fact, too. When a kid kicks a, a, a basketball, and the ball goes on somebody's property and they get shot down. And your leaders and my leaders are not blaming weapons of violence. They're blaming people who are trying to make the world better. That's a death spiral. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily helpful. I think you go to environmental rallies and people think, well, it's just some facts people don't know. So if I say this fact, then people will care. Or if I just scare the bejeebers out of them. Which is hard because that's where people are. Right? We're looking at trauma, a nation that's traumatized. And a topic that most people don't want to hear is that it's not that people don't care. If this were genuinely a democracy, we would take care of this pretty quickly. Right? Healthcare, all of those things, very popular. The reason they don't happen is because rich people have bought democracy in the United States. Period. So as long as we try to operate within this economic system and this rigged political system, no wonder people feel hopeless. Right? No wonder people feel despair, that there's nothing they can do. So something that's not really necessarily helpful today is to realize that until we get beyond this economic system, 
we don't really have a democracy. And to understand that, that the, the rich people have bought, the, the, the oil interests have bought the process. Right? When, when you can give money and it's black, you know, it's unaccountable. Uh, when it may be come from other countries, and we don't know, we just don't know. So where's the hope right, for, for this particular Earth Day? Where is the hope that's not based on just kind of distracting ourselves and deceiving ourselves? I think there is uh, a hopeful path. Maybe not hope in the, in the traditional sense, but I think you and I can give ourselves to this value of living the rest of our days in a way that's in harmony with nature and realizing that will be a life that's worth living. It may turn things around. Uh, that, that would always be the hope. But either way, we're not selling out. And that's, I think, what really depresses us. Right? Not, not living for our highest value. So that's a guarantee. You can live your highest value the rest of your life. You can die with nobility uh, and maybe turn things around. That, that can still happen. But one huge problem in this country is that Christianity as it survived serves the other side. The supernaturalism of traditional Christianity is a terrible enemy to the environmental movement. Think about it. If you, if you say that the sacred is supernatural, you're saying the natural isn't. So what you find here is what I think of as nature mysticism. A realignment of Christianity around nature and life and intelligence. And what I want to suggest is that's always what the original product was. That's what Christianity was. And this series is trying to, to, to show that to you. That when Jesus talks, he's quoting from the wisdom passages, the Sophia passages of mystical Judaism. And by the end of this series, it will be rubbed in your face. That when he says, only me, he's not talking about himself. The way Jesus is taught would probably mortify him because it makes him sound like a total narcissist. Like, I'm the only one. But I tell you what, I'll take pity on you if you'll come and grovel at my feet. That's not what Jesus was teaching. And when we look at the sayings of Sophia, we realize he's talking about cosmic wisdom. He's not talking about his own self. I hope by the end of this series that will be painfully obvious. Sophia was a figure in mystical Judaism that represented cosmic wisdom, natural wisdom. Jesus points to the wisdom. He quotes Sophia all the time. The people that heard him would have heard Sophia first. Right? Before they would have heard Jesus, they would have heard this earlier tradition. And so they would have heard it in that context, calling them not to Christianity, but to life, to nature. Now, one of the missing pieces, the word logos is, is the Greek word uh, with a masculine tense. Sophia was the Jewish word. And you see in the early church this merger of the logos and Sophia. There's one text that I'll be talking about later that says his name was Christ, her name is Sophia. So that this one sacred source of something goes across the whole spectrum of human thought. If the source of the universe were a male, a humanoid male, then we would all be products that were made like a pot. We would be artificial. Right? If the image includes the feminine, 
then that's different. Instead of being made like an object, we're born out of it. That is a huge missing piece of feeling our roots into life and into nature. You weren't made like a pot. You were born like a beloved child. You, you're the, the expression. We're going to be looking at different versions of the tree of life. This is a symbol someday before I die, hopefully, I would like prominently displayed. The key to the tree of life is the roots have to be as big as the branches. We look at trees and cut them off at the ground. We have been taught that this world was made for us. We don't realize we are leaves on this tree. And until we do, Christianity is a problem. It's a problem to believe that the whole universe was designed for human beings and not for animals, not for trees, not for plants. So Sophia is calling us to the tree of life. Jesus is calling us to the tree of life. It's calling us to wholeness not to the superstitions of the church. Traditional religion is something you can't know if it's true or not. What happened to Jesus 2,000 years ago, you can pretend like you know, but you don't. And the church can only produce hypocrites when it tells you that's what truth is. Say what we told you to, recite it like you're a cockatiel. But come here and you'll recite a creed and pretend like that's what you believe. That's not helpful to be very mild. That's, that's not helpful. But if Jesus is quoting the source of life, if Jesus is calling us to the tree of life when he says, only me, then it's true and you know that from your own experience. The story of Jesus is the story of all of us. Remember I've said before, the way you decode these religious symbols is they have to be true for everyone, everywhere, all the time. That's what makes them universal. So every human being is born of whatever that sacred something is. You're not made. You're not standing on nature, you are nature. And when you look at this image of the tree of life, and you realize I'm a branch on it, your life suddenly makes a whole lot more sense. Why did I get that disease? If the world is designed for me, why did I have that accident? We have to invent these crazy, this crazy God that makes all that kind of stuff happen. But if we're a branch on the tree, then bad stuff happens sometimes. But that doesn't mean we're cut off. And the key is to realize when Jesus is called the beloved one, the only begotten one, that's you too. When Jesus is the only begotten one, that's not a mathematical equation. That's the love that every parent has for every child. A parent loves you as the only child. Each one. You may have 10. My mom used to say, you're my favorite Jimmy, and you're my favorite Ricky, and you're my favorite... Fortunately, there, were, there weren't other Jimmys in the neighborhood. I might have been placed a little lower. But, but that's what love is, isn't it? When you write a love poem and you say you're the only one, you're not talking mathematics. Neither was Jesus. Neither was Jesus. So to accept that we are not made by this artificial God, we're not artificial beings. We're as much a part of nature as a tree. So we don't have to question our purpose. We don't have to question whether we deserve to be here. So that's, that's number one. Realize, in one of the creeds that says that Jesus was begotten, not made, that's all of us. But you need the feminine to get it. Guys can't do that. As I said last week, who needs the bosom of Abraham? 
That was Joseph Campbell that said that. Okay, so then second, is that means the word doesn't refer to letters in a book. The word is the creative principle of the universe itself. That's what the logos is. That's what the Sophia is. So again, you don't have to trust that I know what I'm talking about. Thank God, right? You don't have to assume I know what I'm talking about. You look at your own experience and you realize there are patterns here. They're very mysterious, but they're patterns. And you don't have to question that. Let's look at the next tree. I like this one too, because it's got the sun and the moon. Um, when Jesus talks about himself, he's also talking about the creative principle of the universe. Listen to the Sophia passage. And, and again, people would have heard this before they heard Jesus. I mean, when you see that thing in the, beginning, in the beginning was the word, the word was God, the word was with God, the word. And you have to pretend that makes sense. It doesn't. It, it turns Christianity into philosophy. But if you had heard this first, Sophia singing, that she was there at the beginning, when God gave the sea its boundary, when the waters were not overstepped their command, when God marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was constantly at God's side. Again, this is Sophia. This is not Jesus talking. Yet. I was constantly... At God's side, I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in God's presence, rejoicing in God's whole world, and delighting in humankind. Now then, my children, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Now, if that's the heart of nature speaking, that's different than a cult leader of a religion. But if Jesus says, do what I tell you to do, and you'll be okay, nobody gets hurt. That sounds like a mobster. <laughs> but if it's calling you to your own roots, your own essence in life, in nature, then yeah, you better tune yourself to nature or there's going to be problems in your life. So Jesus is talking, basically quoting Sophia, embodying it, so that we can feel that within ourselves. To follow Jesus means to find your own roots. It doesn't mean to say yes to what a preacher is saying. Again, thank God. Symbols that do not refer us to nature are like watches that don't keep time. They're like compasses that have lost their magnetism. If you're following a compass and you're on a ship and it's not magnetized, you're in worse shape than if you don't have a compass. You're just going whatever the thing is pointing north. It's the same thing when you take Scripture literally. It's the song of the earth. It's the song of the cosmos. And you feel that in your body. Here's another uh, wonderful quote by, I think, Sophia. It's in Job, but it's wisdom. Remember uh, Job, his religious friends are making theological excuses for everything that's happening? And he's basically saying, well, that's a crock, which is a theological term. <laughs> this is Job. But ask the animals and they will teach you. Or the birds in the sky. Does that sound familiar? But ask the animals and they will teach you. Or the birds in the sky and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth and it will teach you. Or let the fish in the sea inform you. Which of these does not know that the hand of the sacred has done this. In the sacred's hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all humankind. Again, you're not being asked to believe squiggles on a page. The word is the creative principle of your own being and every other being that, that we meet. So the third point I want to leave you with to think about, and again, this is going to be a fairly long series and I'm hoping at the end of it, uh, it'll be clear that the, the religion that you were given is not necessarily uh, what touches your heart. Um, but you've always known this. You just had to pretend like I did. Pretend like, yeah, that makes sense. 
In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. God is holy. I mean, Jesus is fully human, fully divine. Sure. Fully fish, fully horse. Sure. It's sacred poetry. And I believe it's absolutely true, but you have to experience it. You can't just think it. So the final thing is when we hear this word at the core of our being, we realize we found our context. We found our home. Even in the chaos that confronts us now. There's a, a wonderful quote in Braiding Sweetgrass that says, which is a, a scientist and indigenous person in one body, bringing together science and this indigenous mysticism. And she says, the land recognizes you even if you're lost. There's something that speaks to us because we are products of that creative principle. Everything else that's a, a product speaks to us, teaches us, guides us. But we have to realize, let's look at the last one. We have to realize that we are branches on the tree. When we look at the pain of the world and we say, why is this happening to us? The answer is it isn't just happening to us. We're a branch on the tree. Right, it's insanity to think that this universe was created for us. It's insane to think that a humanoid deity is just wanting you to believe. But it's magnificent if the symbol is actually calling us to the ground of our own being. What a gift that would be. But to do that, you have to re symbolize the symbols of Christianity and stop taking them literally. That idea that if you're good, you go to heaven, if you're bad, you go to hell, is the probably the biggest scam in human history. Right? What a, what a rigged game that is. You come to church, you do what the preacher says, you give us 10% of your money, and after you die, stay with me on this, <laughs> I don't got nothing for you while you're alive, but as soon as you die, you have some pretty nice house, pretty nice house. I mean, that makes cryptocurrency look legitimate. <laughs> Heaven is a symbol of when we're in tune with the universe. Hell is a symbol when we're not. And you can look at your own life and you'll see that real clear. You don't have to have a furnace underground to be in hell. And you don't have to be on the sky. The symbols break down. A couple of weeks ago, I was talking about, like, we look at centaurs and think, well, that's a really stupid thing. But then we believe in angels that are half bird, half person. <laughs> and we have to ignore the fact that they can only fly up to about the clouds. <laughs> right? That's, that's, it's a symbol of something. And what it symbolizes is absolutely real in your life, but it has to be your life. It has to be your experiences. And then you'll know why you have to give yourself on behalf of, of caring for the planet, caring for animals, love can only grow in that direction. It's all of us. It's finned people, it's feathered people. That's all of your family and it's all around you. And it's beautiful and it's wonderful and to live like that will be worthwhile no matter what the rest of the world does. So, when we look at our nation and we see a kind of a death spiral, more and more money on violence, less and less money on people, and you see the church on that side, churches filled with people that are willing to lie in denial of science, to call their enemies horrible, horrible things, when Jesus said, love your enemies, and to realize your life doesn't have to be like that. And you can leave that right now and live the rest of your life as a gift, a magnificent gift. The greatest hope for saving the planet is for us to live like that, but it'll be a good life no matter what happens. 
So we see our species in a kind of a death spiral. But we're also called to be ambassadors of a better way. The reason the church is a part of the death spiral is because they aren't hearing the song of Sophia that Jesus was singing. So to realize we are begotten, not made. Jesus is the example. Jesus is not the exception. You are not an object. You are born into the world with a kind of a mission to spread that love. And it has to be ecological love, right? It has to be everybody, including birds, fish, insects. And then to realize that the creative principle within you is what Jesus is calling the word, whether you call it Logos, Sophia. It's all around you, guiding you, teaching you. And finally, you realize that when you live your life like that and you give yourself wholly to it, you have found your context, you have found your home, you have found your purpose there on the tree of life. Well, these are my thoughts on these passages. We invite you now to a moment to think about uh, what you believe.